home again. Church can feel like home, right? But you don't live there, but it feels like home because of the people that are there. And same thing with a house. It becomes a home because of the people and the love that's there. It is a house that needs to be built uh, so that you can sustain life. And that does make it a home because it's it feels safe, it feels secure. You're, you can be sheltered from the weather and be warm and dry. And that's part of, you know, picking out a house, just good construction. Now, we've been talking about houses and we're talking about extreme home makeover and the DIY um, makeovers and, you know, the HGTV type of, you know, shows that uh, come and remodel something or redo a house. And those are fun, exciting, they're cool to watch as you see the transformation going on. The idea is that people are looking to either upgrade their house or move into a new house. And when they do this on the shows, oftentimes what goes on is that they, they'll they ask them, well, what's your budget, right? And especially if they're like, um, you know, bargain beachfront, you know, houses or whatever, and I think you can always kind of see the realtor kind of cringe a little bit when they ask that question like, uh, am I going to have to deliver a message? Because they'll say, well, my budget's like $60,000. they are going to be like, well, you could rent a parking space on the beach for $60,000, but you can't buy a house on the beach for $60,000, right? So you have to have this budget. So one of the things that they want to know is before you send me out to look at stuff is it affordable for you can you afford can you buy this you know the house that we have in christ is not just our temple and our body but this new life this new family this love this ultimate forgiveness with god and that came in at an extreme price is it affordable for you and i no we're like those paupers, you know, trying to buy these beachfront mansions that it's not going to work. So what we have with Christ is this awesome gift, right? This incredible blessing. And it talks about in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's unique to Christianity. C.S. Lewis was walking into a bunch of professors that are having this dispute about how is Christianity unique? And so some would say that, well, it's because of the resurrection of Christ. And others would say, well, there are other religions where they have death and resurrection. Now, the difference is, with Jesus Christ, there were actual resurrection that people were eyewitnesses to, right? But, and they were bringing up other things uh, about this. And C.S. Lewis, he, he goes, what's, what's all the hubbub about, you know? And they told him, well, what's unique about Christianity? He goes, oh, it's easy. It's grace. Only in Christianity is this completely free to us by God, because He loves us. That's one of the reasons church feels like home, and that heaven is going to feel like home when we get there, because this is this free gift of God that comes by grace, by unmerited love. He just loves us. And that's what makes a home a home, where you're forgiven, you're just accepted for who you are. And some of us are quirky, right? Some of us, not only are we sinners, just our personalities can be kind of quirky. And we're accepted. We're forgiven. And it, it's just uh, such a blessing in knowing Him and being pulled into this. In Ephesians 2.8 it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And that, not of yourselves, it, the salvation, is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In, in extreme home makeover, in any of these places that try to help people out, like homes on homes and stuff, they try to look for people who they think, well, they're worthy of this aid. They're worthy of this help of an extreme home makeover. These are people that have given back to community, have sacrificed for family. But with Christ, he's not looking for people who've earned it. It's a free gift. It's nothing we can boast about. But we can boast in him because of the free gift. It glorifies him even more. And because he loves us and because we adore him, reverence him, fear him, love him in that, it's this loving communal situation that we honestly feel at home. The cost was his son. Now when they do Extreme Home Makeover, they do these shows, HGTV is going to give away a home. The cost of that is through advertising, right? So if, you know, at the time Sears, now they're closed, but they're going to give their Kenmore, you know, washer and dryer, smart washer and dryer, maybe now it's Samsung or Panasonic. You know, you have the paint stores, Benjamin Moore or whatever, Sherman Williams are going to donate all the paint. They're given, and they're given some finances because they're funding this house. But they're getting something in return. They're getting customers. They're getting advertising. They're getting their brand in front of people. But with Christ, all things that are given to us are not merited. They're not earned. They're free. And the cost was incredibly high. And we need to value that in that. And in doing so, we have this connection with them. We have this feeling of being wanted, right? Now we can jump on a plane. Most people aren't flying right now, but you can jump on a plane and get anywhere in the world in just a short time. It wasn't that long ago when people would have to take an ocean liner just to get from Europe to America. The king of Greece wanted to come visit America, heard about this vast land, and so he got all of his people together, his entourage, and including his his dog, his pets, uh, let's go to America. And the his attache, his person who's his butler who's helping him, also loved this dog. Would take the dog out for walks and on the deck. And this dog was pretty rambunctious, so. The dog loved to play catch, and they were playing catch. Well, it happened so that this ball bounced kind of crazy. You kind of understand what's going on. The dog went after it, went overboard. And so the guy's panicked. He runs to the cabin. You know, he's trying to get the captain to stop the ship. And the captain's like, I'm not stopping. I'm not turning this huge ocean liner around for a dog. Uh, no dumb dog's worth that. And besides, he's he's gone already. He's dead. Well, he begged him. He wouldn't do it. The guy ran to the back. He could see out in the distance the dog's head bobbing up and down. He could see, hey, this dog is alive. He's treading water. So he ran back up to the cabin. And he said, again, I'm not doing this. I'm not stopping for any animal. So this guy ran to the back, took off his sho shoes, and he jumped overboard. He grabbed a life jacket right before he did that. And he swam out to the dog and pulled the dog. And of course, as soon as anybody saw this, and they alerted the crew, and the crew began to shout, man, overboard. And then they stopped the vessel, and they turned it around. Why? Because the individual, people are are you know, valuable. And Christ died for you. He died for me. Why? Because he considers you valuable. 
it isn't just that he's worthy of praise and that he is you know this loving in his love he values you that doesn't mean we earn the righteousness that he imputes to us or we earn his love but you are something special to him you are a pearl of great price you are a treasure that he gives his life for that's how he looked at us he's not like that ocean liner captain who says ah they're a worthless animal they're a reprobate God doesn't care about you doesn't care about them he does and he loves you so much and that that causes us to have this home is the home affordable we can't afford it but the home that God has for us the new body to, to be with him in, in heavenly places that is something that um, is it, there's not even words to describe it I'm trying to describe it what could how could you describe it you know I was watching one of these shows and this person they've got this house when they were broke and they were hitting hard times now they had given to the community and stuff but they were saying what words beyond thank you how do you say greater than thank you you know it's like for Christ there's no words to express this gift you've given us and the Lord wants us to appreciate the eternal life and the where we're at with him I mean I don't think we understand and know the love that's coming our way after this life when Jesus was on the cross and the thieves were going back and forth and calling them names and finally one defended him and and he said Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and he says this day you'll be with me in paradise and then some people ask the question well they, he descended down into hell it talks about this in Peter and also in Ephesians how is that paradise well it's paradise because that's where Jesus is wherever Jesus is whether it's a rundown shack a beat up tent on rocks or in heaven it's paradise because he's there and it's it's the glory that we look forward to and of and of joining him in Luke 23 39 through 43 it talks about that the criminals and when he when he says this very thing he says that you know he he says this with conviction it's you're going to be with me in paradise it's emphatic because you made this commitment you will be at home you'll be blessed in your new home there's a old old-timey doctor you know out in the country he still makes house calls and brings his dog with him and they oftentimes he'll ride in his old truck and he went to this house of this aged farmer and the farmer he's upstairs and he knows he's dying the doctor's there to kind of bring comfort and any last things that he needs you know painkillers and stuff the man looks at the doctor and he says can can you tell me what it's going to be like on the other side and and what it's going to feel like and the doctor was kind of taken back because you know he wasn't he was prepared to answer some medical questions but not this like life purpose question and so he paused for a bit and and was like huh well and then he heard this scratching at the door and it, it came to him because he was not quite sure what to say but the dog had grown impatient heard the doctor's voice and was scratching at the door and he goes I can't tell you all what heaven is going to be like what it's going to feel like he just says he says you, you hear my dog scratching at the door he, he said he doesn't know what's on the other side he's never been here but he hears his master's voice and he knows that there's comfort and ear rubs <laughs> with his master 
And he and he's he can't wait to get there. He goes, that's what the other side's like. And I think that's so precious about that. And in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places, because we're in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace or his love in kindness towards us in Jesus or in Christ Jesus. This is powerful because it talks about that we're in Christ Jesus, we're invited in him, and he's made us to sit in heavenly places. Sit in heavenly places means you reside, you live in, you now are a permanent homeowner with Christ. He's given us all things, made us inherit this. We call this home because we own it. We're not guests. We're not renting it. We're not, you know, leasing it. We're not there for just a short time. We're with Him forever. To be with Him in heavenly places. George MacDonald was trying to share heaven with his son, and his son talked to him and said, You know, Dad, that seems almost too good to be true. That we're going to be in heaven like this. And his dad said, You know what? It does sound too good to be true, but it must be true. It's too good to be true in the sense of we don't deserve it, but it must be true in the sense of if our heart yearns for it, there must be something there to satisfy that. Just like your heart or your body yearns for food, and there is something, food, that's, that is substance for you, that satisfies you, he goes, if your heart yearns for something greater than this world, something better than this world, something that is beautiful beyond this world and reparative, something that is healing, something that where it's pure joy and comfort, there must be something to be able to satisfy that yearning. So, son, it must be true. It's one of those arguments that they use to show God and to prove God. It is something that we are destined to if we choose him in faith. Scripture says that we are saved by grace through faith. That you put your faith in him and then the grace is extended to us. It's extended in the offer to begin with, right? But that welcoming that he says those who received him he gives the authority or the power to become children of God and in this we have then that destination and we're sure of it it's like the old mountain mountaineer who who's no he's dying and his wife is called to his bedside and he says now so now woman go go to the fireplace a third rock from the left you pull that out and you bring that to me, what is behind there. And she did. She found this mason jar just packed full of money. Over the years, he had stuffed money away. He goes, now, I'm going to die soon. You go put that up into the attic. And when I leave this body and I go up, I'm going to take that with me. And she did as he said. He passed away. A few days later, she remembers that jar. She goes back up. It's still there, packed full of money, and she said to herself, you know, knowing him, I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> well, you can't take it with you. You can't take your money with you. And the only way that you enter into the heavenly places isn't that somebody says, well, I recognize the man upstairs. It, it's something that I res I'm spiritual and I respect spiritual things. It's that we choose Jesus Christ. Because he paid the price for us. No one else has. No other religion. No other place has offered this grace to us. Only through Christ Jesus. And in this, he provides for us this place as well as everything else we need. Now, on this earth, we don't get everything we want. We do get what we need through him. 
your needs are basic, right? In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, it says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. God is waiting for us and wanting to bless us. And he'll take care of the basic needs we have. Now, he also wants to do many of our wants, and he'll take care of that too. But there's a balance there in what we need and our maturity and stuff. And when my kids were younger, I told them to make a Christmas list. Now, you're not going to get everything on that list. You'll get probably what you need for sure and some of your wants, but not everything you want is what you really need, if you get my drift, right? You don't need that right now, and that's not going to help you right now. This is not something that's going to be a blessing, and so I'm not going to give you all your wants, but by denying you some of those, you're going to get what you need. Because some of those things, by not getting them, it actually will bless and enhance your life, and you'll grow without them, character-wise, right, spiritually. In Matthew 7, 7 through 11, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, are not perfectly good, know how, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? God is so good to deliver, even before we ask, many of the things that we truly need and some of the things we truly want. He's so good. Reminds me of the missionary... Helen Reservier, she was a missionary to Nigeria, and her children were with her, uh, her husband, but they, had, they were ministering to this family, and the woman died in childbirth, and they had this child, and it was premature. So they wanted to, it's a poor area, poor country, and so the, there wasn't a hospital nearby. And so they wanted to make a homemade incubator to kind of help this child, otherwise it would die. And the only hot water bottle they could find in the area was irreparable, it was damaged. So they were praying, they said, let's pray, let's pray right now. We need, you know, some of these things, especially need a hot water bottle so we can make this impromptu incubator. But without it, this child's not gonna make it through the night. So they began to pray and the daughter, the younger daughter, she's like about eight, and she goes, this child needs, needs a baby to, to be with her, to comfort her, and he's like a baby doll. And she goes, well, sweetie, pray for the baby doll. It's not really what we need, but many times God will ask, answer what we want, and so they prayed and prayed, and they received a package that very day, and sure enough, the daughter rips open the package, starts digging through, and there's the hot water bottle. But she turned to her mom and she smiled and she dug down a little farther and she goes, Mom, you know what's in here? And she goes, a baby doll? And she goes, yes. And she goes, I think that was meant for you. And she goes, no, yes, it was meant for me to answer my prayer so I could give it to this little, this little baby. They found out that the women's club at the church back at the hometown put this package together three months earlier and then had mailed it, and it took that long to get to them. And so God had answered that prayer even before they had asked it because he knew what they needed. And he'll oftentimes bless far above. Matter of fact, in, in Ephesians, we've been talking a lot in Ephesians chapter 3, it talks about that he will do exceedingly abundantly above what we oftentimes ask or think because he's he's over the top dad. I like to think of him as that way. He's over the top dad. I needed this, but he went above and beyond. 
I wanted this, but he is so much nicer, so much l more loving, so much better than I can conceive of that he oftentimes does great things with and through you. He wants to do that. And in that, we, we need to trust in him. Uh, there's so much in life where we kind of lower expectations. Dream big with God. Be satisfied with what we get, but dream big with him. There's a story of Charles Eliot, who uh, was president of Harvard University. Now, this family had a great loss in their family, and so they went to the university and he said, we want to start like a, a foundation, a donation to the university, and he, he's like, you mean like a, like a scholarship? And they go, no, more like maybe add a building on to the university. And they were unpretentious. They were dressed, you know, kind of, they were in mourning. They weren't all dressed up. And he kind of wrote them off. He goes, I, I think, go home, talk amongst yourself. You want to do some kind of scholarship fund or something like that. We'll talk later, but um, you know, I think you guys are thinking too big. And the problem was is that he underestimated them. He was kind of patronizing to them. Well, it wasn't that long after that that he heard about this new fund, this new foundation that they started. It's the Leland Stanford Junior Foundation that started the uni a university. They built a whole university and is now known as Stanford. We just know it as Stanford. And so oftentimes we aren't thinking enough, close enough, and paying close enough attention that God wants to do far greater than what we're thinking. He's so good. He's such a good dad. And in being so good with us, he gives us something that's going to last forever. This isn't a, what they call a pie crust promise, easily made, easily crumbles type of thing. I think it's a quote from Mary Poppins. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, something that's now revealed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then we shall, be, we shall be brought to pass by the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? In this blessing, in this giving, he wants us to know it's permanent. So life is temporary. We, we might go a long time, 80, 90, 100, 100 plus years. For that's, us, that's kind of a long time. As you get older, it goes by so fast, right? A house only lasts so long. Even if you renovate it, you update it, you got to bring it out of the 70s. Dirt, hello! The 70s called, you know, they want their paneling back. Well, what you do now is only going to last for another 20, 30 years, right? 50 years, and somebody's going to say, this is old stuff, it needs to be updated. But when we go from this life to the next, what we receive is never going to need to be updated. It never grows old. It never gets old. And the joy we're going to have is continual. The blessing we're going to have is eternal and ever increasing because what he has planned for us 
The mind can't even think about it. The eye can't perceive it. It's going to be awesome what he begins to do in us. And because of that, we need to be pilgrims and sojourners on this earth. Do the right and proper things we need for our own house. Do the upkeep of your house. Maybe even remodel, you know, type of thing. But the most important thing is that we build relationships that we remodel our heart continually, right? Go in and make it, repaint it from black to white to make it, uh, open it up and bring the light in, right? To, to restore it, to mend the wounds and the cracks and, and to look for that permanent solution when we, when we visit him, when we are in our permanent home and our permanent residence. And then it isn't, you know, hey, bus driver, move that bus. It's when we, we hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or when, the, when we hear the, the sounding of the trumpet and we hear that voice, come up here. I have something to show you. Your new home. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Ah, can't wait for that. Well, that wraps it up. So until the next time, next week, when we visit together, I know we're separated now because of the restrictions in COVID and it, it's not practical, but at least we can share this. And maybe you can share this video on your Instagram feed or link to it or over to, uh, you know, Facebook or one of the other social media platforms that you can get the word out. And so until next time, love ya and we'll see ya either here either sooner or later, right? All right, God bless.